Hi, I'm Marty Nimco. I was talking with uh, someone who had read my new book, Soloists, which are it's 234 short, short stories about introverts and outsiders facing a dilemma. And she said, it's really good, but it's so dark. And I thought rather than fighting it, I thought for this podcast, I would go through and read the, to myself the 234 and pick out the ones that were the darkest. And there were quite a few that were dark. I came up with 31 that are particularly dark. And I thought, um, um, you might find them interesting. They won't be uplifting. But, you know, sometimes we are so interested in the entertainment world and being providing happy talk. That just maybe this is a, a, a bit of a balance. Anyway, these <coughs> each of these stories just takes two or three minutes. And uh, this first one is called Dog Stolen Reward. Jessica had a stressful job as a social worker. So more even than most dog owners, she was glad at the end of the day to get that enthusiastic greeting from her sweet doggy Bella. Bella had to hold it in all day because Jessica lived in an apartment. So Jessica's first priority was to take Bella for a walk. And to kill two birds with one stone, they made a quick stop at Trader Joe's. She only needed half and half for her beloved morning coffee and spring greens for her daily virtuous salad. As usual, Jessica tied Bella to a post in an inconspicuous place on the side of Trader Joe's. For years, there was never a problem, but today, when Jessica returned, Bella was gone. Jessica raced around, drove around, yelling, Bella, to no avail. She constantly checked her cell phone because Bella's tag listed her phone number and the word reward. Finally, adrenaline dissipated. Jessica plodded back home and got herself a glass of wine to wait out the vigil. A damn thief will call to get his fucking reward, I hope. And the thief did. Teresa, 18, single mother of two, struggling to live amid the noise of an SRO, felt desperate. So when she saw the docile Bella and the tag saying reward, Teresa took Bella, who, trusting Sweetie, came willingly. Flatly, Teresa said, I've got your dog, I need 500. Jessica, so relieved, suppressed anger and quickly said, oh, okay. Teresa responded, you answered too fast. A thousand, take it or leave it. I can get two for the dog. Jessica, now educated, feigned tears, waited and murmured, that'll wipe me out. But, okay, where should we meet? They met in a remote warehouse district with Bella in Teresa's arms. Jessica tearfully ran to Bella. Not so fast. We forgot about the $300 sales tax. 1300 or I sell her. Jessica, suppressing anger, said, Honestly, I, 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 I don't have it. I, I took the 1000 from the bank. Go to the ATM. Jessica returned with the extra 300 and counted out $1,300 whereupon Teresa took the money and handed Bella back to Jessica. Teresa laughed. I would have taken 50 bucks. Maybe I should take a poker. Anyway, that story is called Dog Stolen Reward. As I said, dark. The next one is called After the Ball Dropped. On the night of December 30th, the New York City government cleaned up Times Square. On New Year's Eve, the next night, there was not to be one homeless person for the cameras to catch. But Joe managed to find a doorway far enough away, yet close enough that he could limp out to join the crowd watching the ball drop. And the ball dropped, lovers kissed, and Joe bowed his head and kept it bowed, not because he was humbly fitch pitching for spare change, but because he wanted a little kindly attention, and with head bowed, he wouldn't seem threatening. Soon, Joe did get a little attention, though not the kindly kind. A pair of those lovers strode to him. He looked like a rich mafioso, she like his trophy wife. They were trying too hard to look like big shots. My name's Damien, and this is Angela. How'd you like to make a hundred thousand a year? Joe pursed his lips and thought. They even tried to scam the homeless. No, nah, really. Plus, We'll get you out of this hellhole, New York, and take you back with us to San Francisco, on us. I'll be straight with you. You are the most unassuming guy I've ever seen, old, on crutches. You just saw you move pretty darn good on those sticks. 
I need someone who can, without arousing the cop suspicion, make them uh, street deliveries. Joe bore his eyes into Damien's. Drugs are what got me these crutches. I was high, went between cars to cross the street. Car didn't see me in time and it crushed my leg. How about you help me achieve my dream? I've always wanted to own a couple of espresso carts in an office building lobby or two. I'd run one and I'd hire another disabled person to run the other. Angela laughed. Yeah, you could call it Handy Cappuccino. Damien smirked, threw a hundred dollar bill at Joe's feet. Live the dream, Crip. And he took Angela by the arm and they strutted away. Anyway, that story is called After the Ball Dropped. The next one is called The Cheery Chemo Nurse. In the hospital's changing room, Denise replaced her no-nonsense gray sweats with the pink and purple nurse's uniform she chose for this job. She padded into the empty chemotherapy room and turned on music that was pleasant but not so chipper that its intent to distract was too obvious. Then Denise plastered on the smile she had perfected by practicing in a mirror, and she stepped into the waiting room for chemo patients. Janet Rogers? A 32-year-old who doesn't look like she has cancer peered up at Denise. Janet's fear flashed and embarrassed. She made herself mirror Denise's fake smile and followed her into the chemo room. As Denise was hooking her up, Janet asked, the doctor told me I won't vomit much, but it couldn't hurt to have a second opinion. Denise consulted her chart and said, Doc's right, no biggie. Then Janet asked one more question. I just had a baby. My doctor said I can't breastfeed while doing chemo, right? I was so looking forward to breastfeeding. Denise nodded. Breast milk won't transmit cancer, but the chemo wouldn't be so good for your baby. St Janet, you're stage one. You're getting mild chemo. You'll be fine. Denise returned to the waiting room. Michael Sanders? A swarthy 55-year-old strode in, face neutral. To break the ice and distract him while she was setting up, Denise asked, So, Mr. Sanders, anything you want to tell me about yourself? I had big dreams to create a heated sweater, so instead of having to heat the entire house or office, you only heat what counts, you. I had that dream until this. Denise replied, Lots of people with stage two just fine. I hope you won't give up your dream. He was silent as she inserted the needle. Harold Goldman? A man who looked 80 lifted his hand. Denise helped him up and into the room. She looked at his chart. He was only 65, but it had two cancer surgeries, two rounds of radiation, and this was to be his third round of chemo, an experimental potent protocol that's approved only for end-stage patients. Denise reverted to a standard introduction. Mr. Goldman, how are you feeling today? He said, how do you think? Whereupon she said, sounding more chipper than she intended. Okay, let's do this. He said, okay, you first. She appreciated the humor, but stopped smiling when he mumbled, I, I, I can't do this anymore. And he struggled to his feet. Mr. Goldman, please sit down. And he limped out. 21 more patients and Denise changed back into her sweats. In the peace of her car, she flashed on her husband, who died a year ago in pain of cancer, despite or perhaps exacerbated by the side effects of the poison she puts into people's arms every day. She thought, please God, don't let me get cancer. And she put on her mixtape of pep me, up, pep me up music, starting with Celebrate. In any case, that story is called A Cheery Chemo Nurse, the next one is called Birth and Death. Yes, I had told Victoria that I wanted children. And by the time I did, and at the time I did, I was infatuated with her, with the idea of having and raising a child and maybe having someone to care for us in our old age. The desire to have kids was fueled by our friends who had them. They emphasized the positives, if only not to seem cold or like bad parents. And of course, our grandparents were salivating for grandkids. But then worries intruded. Bye-bye freedom. Waking up in the middle of the night. Fighting with the kid about homework. Will I even be a good parent? My job isn't that secure. Can we afford to have a baby? And what if our baby isn't normal? I decided not to say any of that to Vicky. I could just imagine her reaction. What? You said you wanted a baby. So what do you want to do now? Get an abortion? No. I could picture her screaming, then crying, then miserable through the pregnancy 
and blaming me forever for spoiling her motherhood. My worry about an abnormal baby was justified. Lou Jr. was born with an APGAR score of six, which predicts low IQ. The first time Vicky and I had sex after Lou was born, my erection wasn't as hard as usual, and over the next months I became softer and softer until I couldn't have intercourse. In frustration, Victoria said, You're doing this to punish me. Of course that wasn't true, and I got so angry that I did something I never thought I'd never do. I slapped her in the face hard. Even in retrospect, I sort of feel she deserved it, but I do recognize that hitting a woman is strictly verboten. In the next months, we didn't even try to have sex, and our relationship declined further, in, par in part because we didn't have sex available to a bomb life's problems. And atop regular problems, there was Lou, who was difficult, low IQ or not. He was what Victoria called fussy, which I thought was an understatement. And yes, once at 3 a.m. when Lou was already six months old and was up yelling half the night, and when I finally got to bed, back to bed exhausted after unsuccessfully trying to calm him, I actually said it. You know, Vicky, Lou is a nightmare. Victoria seethed. That hurts me more than even that slap, much more. A month later, Vicky expanded on a Lorena Bobbitt. She poisoned my dinner and then, with the help of my chainsaw, cut me up and threw me down, down the garbage disposal and got away with it. She simply told the cops I had never gone, that I had gone for a walk and never returned. The investigation turned up nothing, so the cops assumed it was just another case of a spouse walking out, and they tossed the case into the cold case file. I'm writing to you from purgatory, hoping that Vicky feels at least ambivalent about what she did. In any case, that story is called Birth and Death. The next story is called All, It's All About the Power. I'm going to start with just a little bit of an explanation. Having taught in the public schools myself, I learned that conventional wisdom about bullies isn't always true. They often have irrationally high self-esteem, not a veneer of high self-esteem. They really think they're great. They're bullies because they get off on the power and feel they'll get away with it or suffer just minor reprisal. The following short story, short, short story, is based on a true story of a seventh grader. I elbowed him in the face. Why not? There's no referee, no free throws for a foul. Plus, I love scaring kids. They don't mess with me. The kid I elbowed said, you're a bully. I love that. Gave me an excuse to bust him up. I kept pounding his face and almost got him unconscious, but the security guards pulled me off and dragged me into school social worker's office. She was a typical stupid nicey-nicey. She said something like, to feel such anger, you must be hurting. That's what low self-esteem will do. I know you don't want to be mean. I laughed in her face. She's clueless. I showed her. My self-esteem is just fine. I love the power. I went right at her and almost got to her, but I guess the security guards heard her screaming. They can't hold me for long. Anyway, that story is called It's All About the Power. The next story is called I Am Going to Have the Baby. John was pretty average except for his looks. The girls flirted with him, but he had eyes only for Emma, even though she was probably the most religious girl in his school. To remind herself and perhaps others of her faith, she usually wore a too large cross. Emma flirted with John by sitting in his line of sight in the cafeteria. During recess, she stood where he could see her, and her next move was to ask him if he wanted to go to church with her. Sitting next to her, his ardor grew, and as they walked out, he asked if she'd like to hang out. She agreed, but said it had to be at her apartment where her mother, when her mother was still there. He, was, he too was not eager to push, so he found himself glad he, that she said that, although he was nervous about going to the public housing project where Emma lived. But such hanging out is combustible, and when there's a will, there's a way. So they took walks and found secluded places to kiss, and later, more than kiss. They admitted that they were both virgins, but in part because they had both just smoked weed for the first time, they agreed to go all the way. They stopped at a drugstore and decided both would go in to get the condoms. And all proceeded naturally, beautifully, that, that time and the next few times. Then, as he got more relaxed and she more comfortable, he said, it would feel so good to be next to you, if you know what I mean. She nodded but said, I don't want to get pregnant. In his passion and ignorance, he insisted he would pull out, and she silently consented. But as they got near climax, she whispered, it's okay. And at that moment, blinded to the consequences, he came deep inside her. In the light of day, love gave way to fear. What if she was pregnant? 
They dismissed it because it was unlikely, but when she tested before her next period, she was indeed pregnant. She decided to tell him in a public place and so invited him to a cafe. You know I'm a Catholic, a real Catholic. I, I don't believe in abortion. My parents don't believe in abortion. God doesn't believe in abortion. I am going to have the baby. Thoughts flooded his brain. We're not ready to be parents. She's poor. My parents would have to support it. They'd be so angry. Would I have to drop out of school and get a job? Damn, one moment's passion and 18 years of being a parent? And we're under 18. In health education class, they said it in our state sex under 18, even if consensual, is statutory rape. Most kids do it, but could I go to jail? But all he said was, I love you, we'll figure it out. He walked her home, kissed her, and then padded home. Options flashed through his mind, including suicide. In any case, that story is, I am going to have the baby. The next story is called An Exploding Balloon. I wanted to make some money, so in the mall, when I saw a sign in the piano store for a salesperson, I went in. The manager scoffed, but you're a teenager. People buying an expensive piano won't buy from a kid. They'll think I'm cute, and I play the piano. Okay, piano player, play something. I knocked out the first few bars or something, and he said, okay, I'll try you out. But I need to control my risk. No salary, only commission. That means you only eat what you kill. Are you going to train me? The only training you need is to smile a lot, ask why they want a piano, be enthusiastic in response, show them three pianos, more overwhelms them, few makes them feel they don't have enough choices, watch and listen to their reactions. If needed, remind them of why they want a piano and say, my boss has authorized me to give a 20% discount today only. I could have it delivered tomorrow or Saturday. Either one work for you? It was overwhelming, but I didn't want to sound like I didn't understand, like I was some dumb teenager, so I just said, okay, what do I do now? Call the names on this prospect list. They've been in the store before or on a mailing list we bought of people who clicked on an ad for pianos. When you get bored with that, stand in front of the store, and when anyone even glances at you or at a piano in the window, say, I'd you like to try one, or would you like me to play something for you? Give people two choices, both of which you like, and they'll usually pick one. Oh, and wear a jacket and tie. We have to portray an upscale image. Pianos are expensive. Call after call, all I got was stuff like, sorry, or I hate telemarketers, or they hung up without a word. I told the boss that I must be doing something wrong, but he said, nah, that's the real world, kid. You need umpteen no's to get one maybe. You might as well learn that now. Take a break from the call and go outside and pitch them. But I got the same result, flat expressions as they walked on, sometimes a sneer. And what made me quit? You look whack. That's urban slang for ridiculous. Jacket and tie, go home, mama's boy. What made that hurt so much was that it was on top of the reaction I usually get from girls in school. For example, when I say hi, the best I ever get back is a flat hi, as she walks on, maybe even speeds up. I feel like shit, treated so unfairly. What put me over the edge was that the teachers say that white males are privileged. I'm not privileged. Everything I've gotten, I've earned. Everything my parents got, they earned. And they're far from rich. I wanted to say that, but when I saw a kid try to argue with the teacher and she shot him down, I just held it in. But I'm like a balloon that keeps getting filled until it bursts. We always have a rat problem in our apartment, so we keep the economy-sized rat poison around. I'm not sure what I did was right, so to be safe, I'm not going to tell you what I did so I don't cause a copycat. At the end of the trial, the judge asked if I had anything to say. I figured that reverse psychology had the best chance of working, so I fake cried. I hate myself and deserve the worst punishment. It worked. The judge said something like, I am moved by your contrition. In this state, I couldn't sentence you to adult prison. You're only 17. But I could send you to the juvenile, deten juvenile, deten juvenile detention center for three years. But I'll make it two years with the possibility of early, early release for good behavior. I continued the fake agony at the same time. I was wondering whether I should learn from the experience and try to pull something without getting caught. Honestly, I'm not sure. Anyway, that short story is called An Exploding Balloon. The next story is called uh, It's Not My Job to Make You Coffee. Martel, I'm swamped. Would you make me coffee? Trying not to sound angry, Martel said, Michael, you know it is not my job to make you coffee. I'm your administrative assistant. That means Word docs, scheduling, and screening your email. It does not make me your maid. Never mind. Michael tried to say it evenly, but it came out angry. He thought, you're marginal, Martel. I'd fire you, except it would be so difficult. 
It's understandable that Martell refused. After all, her mother was a maid and proud that Martell had gotten Microsoft certified in Word, PowerPoint, even Excel. Plus, the media had endlessly told Martell that BIPOCs are marginalized. In her mother's word, when you face injustice, you must stand up, if not rise up. It's also understandable that Michael would have liked to fire Martell, especially when HR and other bosses stress collaboration. It doesn't seem like much when he's busy to ask his admin to make him a cup of coffee. Indeed, Michael, despite his master's in computer science from Caltech, sometimes has to do busy work that a high school dropout could do. And Michael's views had roots, roots deeper than college and media. His father was an engineer who believed in, unless you're sick, no excuses, just get it done. But Martell had had enough. This wasn't the first time Michael asked her to make coffee. Worse, when she made a mistake, he'd often sigh condescendingly. And although she hadn't had a pay increase in 18 months, he turned her down. Indeed, hinted she might have to accept a pay cut. She documented all that and filed a grievance with her union, which in turn sent it to HR and to the Equal Opportunity Commission, demanding a hearing. When Michael saw the complaint, he quit and became a self-employed app developer. He's working on a better approach to matching job seekers with employers. In any case, that story is called It's Not My Job to Make You Coffee. The next story is called The Bird Watcher. Deep in the White House, the elite 1A messaging unit was in session. Members included top experts in influencing for Madison Avenue, Madison Avenue, academia, think tanks, and me. The chair started. Nothing could do more for equity than to make D.C. and Puerto Rico the 51st and 52nd states. An, ac an academic chimed in, and it wouldn't do the Democratic Party any harm. A think tank member said, we all know its importance, but early polls show the public is dead against it. We just have to choose the right name. Well, what do our focus groups and survey data tell us? Don't say what it is. The last thing we should call it is the D.C. and Puerto Rico Statehood Act. The swing voters hate the idea. The good news is they like the word fairness. Okay, let's keep it simple. How about the Fairness Act? I asked, what does that have to do with making D.C. and Puerto Rico states? All our names are designed not to educate, but to win. For example, the Inflation Reduction Act had little to do with reducing inflation, yet it was among our greatest triumphs. I then asked, before we get locked into this, is it so clear that the taxpayer, the nation, let alone humankind, will be net better for making D.C. and Puerto Rico states? We are about messaging, not policymaking. Besides, you sound like a Republican. I said, excuse me, I need to use the restroom. I never returned. Indeed, I took early retirement, and thanks to the generous federal pension, I didn't need to earn money again. I could think only about what's next for me. I was tired, so tired of all the manipulation, all the games playing, all the fighting. All I could think of is, what's the least manipulative, most peaceful, least contentious thing I could do? I decided to try bird watching. So I bought myself a pair of birder binoculars, a copy of the book Birds of Maryland, and a logbook to keep track of my sightings, and took myself out to the Audubon Sanctuary. On my first trip, I saw a bluebird, two kinds of swallow, an eagle, and birds I couldn't identify. That should have felt like a success and restorative, but I felt empty. I thought that maybe what I needed was to be social, so I went on a birder's walk with an Audubon group. People were welcoming, and I scored a dozen more sightings, but I quickly concluded that birding wasn't the answer. I see it like escaping into uselessness, like playing golf or watching TV. The feeling grew, and when someone spotted a dying, trembling bird on the ground without thinking, I stepped on it. Was it to end its suffering? To displace my anger at myself or at politics? Some combination? I don't know. I do know that it's made me wonder if I left the D.C. game too soon. In any case, that story is called A Bird Watcher. The next story is called A Confrontive Career Coach. My parents stress that you give a greater gift by telling people an uncomfortable truth about themselves than if you tell a pleasing lie. My parents walked their talk, and I'm grateful for it. They pulled no punches when I was too long-winded, not thorough enough, or too argumentative. My training to become a career coach stressed the opposite. Be accepting, supportive, provide a safe space. While I didn't argue with my instructors because I, I wanted to graduate, their rationale didn't shake my belief in the power of constructive criticism over support. So as a career coach, I made what I believe was the ethical choice to be direct and sometimes to shake a client from too confident complacency, confrontive. For example, a client was a board social security administrator. 
The more I learned about him, the more I realized that in his soul he was entrepreneurial. For example, he said he used to be a ticket scalper, and later admitted he still does it a little. I suggested, perhaps too bluntly, that he needed to sacrifice the security of his ill-suited career as an administrator and become an ethical entrepreneur, but not a scummy one. I'm sure he inferred that the scummy referred to him. He got angry with me, and, and fast forward, but he got angry with me, but fast forward a year, and he was running a moderately successful online business selling used books that he sources from libraries that are getting rid of excess inventory. Another client, a clinical social worker, blabbed on and on about how spirituality-centered she was, including chakras and wicker retreats with naked sage burning dancing in the woods to banish evil spirits in favor of world peace. She said that for the last two years she's been trying to make a related activity or career, doing healings. She's 33 years old, and I asked how much she's made net per year. Answer, less than 3000 I said, you have a hobby. Do you want to continue living off your boyfriend's income? Is that spiritual? You need a career, not a religion. She hated me for a session. Then we explored more remunerative and, yes, more conventional ways to do healing, and she decided to enroll in a course using progressive exposure to help people overcome phobias. Then there was the aspiring singer. She sucked. And while I didn't use those words, I did say, you're paying me for candor. Well, sure, Bob Dylan succeeded with a bad singing voice, but you ain't no Bob Dylan. She walked out right then. Indeed, my confrontive approach was poorly received by too many clients, and my practice slowly withered and withered. So one evening after my last client of the day, I reflected and decided I'd be conventional. I'd be a supportive coach. So when an old guy blamed ageism for his career problems, I put duct tape over my mouth. It would have done more good to remind him of his tech lightness and admitted poor learning speed and memory. He had said, I have CRS, can't remember shit. But I played Mr. Support. I can imagine how frustrating it must be to be the victim of ageism, blah, blah, blah. When clients wanted to use <coughs> creative writing to hide their employment failures and gaps, I remained silent and merely helped them write the resume they wanted. My practice rebounded, but I reflected on my new approach and felt it wasn't ethical and was less helpful. But the catch-22 is that too many clients wouldn't tolerate a confrontive career coach. So I decided to close up shop right after I saw the client who I most believed warranted confrontation. Speaking unvarnished to you, dear reader, he's unintelligent and lazy, but he thinks he's smart and that any lack of drive comes from racism, capitalism, his parents, his boss, everything but him. He claims that the one internal cause of his torpor is immutable. I'm depressed but it's clear that his depression isn't physiological. He has drive for the things he finds fun. An appropriate job and work ethic would go a long way to curing his depression. I told him as much. And yes, at the end of the session, he said, this is our last session. As Soon as we got off the Zoom, I deleted my practice's website, tossed out my business cards from my desk and wallet, and unlisted my phone number. I'm now an eligibility worker for the unemployment office. Here I can, indeed, I'm paid to be confronted. Having been a career coach, I know the lengths that some unemployed people will go to get money. For example, a few clients who had a bad track record at work lied and listed their friends or relatives as their boss. Oh, John was a wonderful employee. Now, for example, when a claimant for unemployment money says that they contacted the required three employers to try to find work, and I sense it's BS, I say, okay, I'll call them now, and I pick up the phone. Often the applicant says something like, uh, well, maybe I didn't. I feel good about being a good steward of taxpayer dollars. I'm a career coach who has made a good career change. In any case, that story is, um, is called uh, Confrontive Career Coach. The next story is called Kansas to Vegas. In the Salina, Kansas church in which I grew up, filled with well-wishers, my dad, Pastor Peter, was at the altar, performing the most important wedding ceremony of his life, mine. With tears in his eyes, he whispered, Mary, do you take Travis to be your lawfully wedded husband in sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer, until death? Before he could say, do us part, I ran out, ripped the just married sign off the back of our car, pulled Travis's suitcase out, left it on the sidewalk, and drove off. I had no idea where I was headed. I just knew I had to get away from ordinary Kansas life, especially daughter of Kansas preacher's life. I got on the interstate and drove west. Except for pit stops, I drove straight through the Oklahoma Panhandle, North Texas, and into New Mexico, where I saw a sign that felt like a sign. Albuquerque 212, Phoenix 520, and Las Vegas 777. 777? And because Vegas is the opposite of ordinary Kansas, I had found my destination. 
What was I going to do there? I have no skills. In Salina, I was just a waitress. On arriving in Vegas, I knew I needed clothes and didn't want to run out of money, so my first stop was a Salvation Army store. I was so nervous, so many things going through my mind, that I forgot I was still in my wedding dress. I only realized it when people started laughing at me. So I grabbed the first dress that had all called to me, of all things, a gold sequin cocktail dress, short, too short, and a scoop neck. Lots of cleavage would show too much. But it sure is different than Kansas. Pure Vegas. And for five bucks, I wasn't going to take the time to try it on. I wanted it out of there now. I tried it on in the car and felt embarrassed. Then I loved it. It was a sign of my new life, the opposite of Salina. I didn't expect to be spending much of my own money on my honeymoon. So I checked into a cheap hotel in a neighborhood I call Dicey, perfect for Vegas. To avoid being seen in sequins, I raced up to my room. I looked at myself in the mirror and thought, next stop, Walmart, to get normal clothes. Then I asked myself, what am I going to do to make money? More waitressing? I'm tired of that. I'm here to do something new. Seeing my cleavage in the mirror, I laughed. Hooker? Never. But I do look like a cocktail waitress, maybe at one of those famous Vegas hotels. So after a good night's sleep, which I sure needed, I went to the fancy hotels I had heard of, Wins, the Venetian, and MGM Grand. All three came up, snake eyes, or is it craps? I don't know, gambling. I asked why they turned me down. Is it my dress? No, they loved my get-up, but wanted to hire someone who already been a cocktail waitress in Vegas. They told me to try the Sahara, Circus Circus, even the best Western, but I got the same answer and got scared. Driving back to my hotel in its dicey neighborhood, I passed Winner's Motel and Casino. Two of the letters in the neon sign were out. I thought, maybe you got to start somewhere. Looking up and down my dress, the manager hired me. I hated the job. The non-stop noise of the slot machines and the players whose politeness sometimes faded into rudeness when they got past their second drink. One guy said, baby, you'll probably make $15 an hour. How'd you like the 200? Come to my room, I'll show you how. I turned him down with a polite thank you, but I don't do that. But after my shift back in my room, I started thinking. After all, my fiance and yeah, other guys said I was hot and it would pay a lot better than winners, motel and casino. But what would my parents think, especially my father, preacher man? But the next morning, which for me was noon, on my phone I went to the website of Camaro Ranch. It wanted applications for courtesans. And without thinking about it much, I applied. I figured they'd never hire me. I definitely had no prior experience working in a brothel. That was a question on the application. But the same day, I got a call for an interview. I wore my sequin dress and they hired me, subject to passing the blood test and the criminal background check. In the meantime, they gave me a training booklet, including how to do a dick check looking for STDs. Two days later, they called and asked if I'd sign a 14-day contract at $1,000 a day. Live in. I signed, but soon broke the contract. There was the very first guy. I didn't get beyond the first few minutes of warm him up conversation when I cried, I can't do this. And as I did at the altar, I ran out and drove back to Salina. As soon as I got home, my parents cried, I cried, and of course I apologized. Next, I saw Travis and swore on a stack of Bibles that I'd never run away again. But he said, Mary, I can't count on you. No. As I am writing this, I'm back to waitressing and wondering if, like my fellow Kansan Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, maybe there really is no place like home. I'm just not sure. In any case, that, that uh, story is called From Salina to Vegas. This story is called um, Okay. This story is called Buried. I have to act just right. I did love my husband, well, kind of, and do want to make him proud. Besides, other people will feel more comfortable if I play the loving, grieving widow. Okay, it's showtime. Walk really slowly, up to the microphone, head down. Stare at the urn. I hope that makes me cry. I begin. John was a great provider. I thought about all the corners he cut, but okay. My shopping habit pressured him a little, but stop thinking about that. He was a fine father. I thought about how he was absent a lot of the time. Stop, focus on the urn. I need to up the adjectives. John was a truly wonderful husband. He was always in his man cave. Look at the fucking urn. I can't count on my boyfriend. It's going to be all on me. Jeez, I'm starting to cry. Not for him, but for me. I looked at the audience, and they're loving my crying. Anyway, that story is called Buried. The next story is called Big Balls. 
VJ Patel looked up at the clock, 6.30 p.m. When he first became an engineer, he would have been happy to work for another few hours, but now he sighed and wished he could quit for the night. Actually, he thought about quitting engineering forever. But all those years I invested in the uh, Institute of Technology and in climbing the ladder, and what would my friends think? My family? I could hear my grandfather. What? You're going to open a restaurant? Only the lower castes do that. Actually, yes, he thought. Indian food is some of the most interesting. And I'd bring my engineer's perfection to it. No oily pre-made buffets. In fact, nothing pre-made. Everything to order. And of course, no canned sauce or gulab jamun. Fresh vegetables. And I'd buy my spices from Vishnu, my friend, who imports the best cumin, coriander, clove, cinnamon, turmeric, fenugreek, cardamom, all of it. I'll make the naan right. Each piece fresh in the tandoor. To keep prices down, I'll find a location that's good, but just iffy enough that the rent will be okay. And he did all that. And his family ridiculed him. His mother said, I am embarrassed. We all are. You're giving up a directorship at Apogee Software to open the 10 millionth Indian restaurant? Idiot! His son, Subaj, was even more vicious. You don't know shit about running a restaurant. You'll piss away your savings and go bust within a year. And then nobody will hire you. Who wants a software engineer who quit to open a restaurant and failed at age 53? VJ did everything he promised he would, and discerning customers returned again and again, but there weren't enough of them. Slowly, VJ's already marginal business shrank. He felt forced to say yes to the ad salesman, who suggested he advertise a 10% off coupon. That didn't help, but VJ said no to upping it to 25%. I will not give 25% I work so hard for. And that's also what he said to the delivery services, DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber Eats. But now, VJ was bleeding serious money and decided to stop minimizing the problem with his son, who was a marketing manager. Subaj said, finally, thank you, Dad, for coming clean. Let me market your business. I can make it successful. The only thing I ask you, give me three months to do it my way. If you don't like the results, you can go back to your way. VJ felt he had no choice. Subaj sprung into action. He decided that the key would be to make the restaurant cool to Gen Zers. VJ's Indian restaurant, stodgy. Mumbai Mambo, better, but Mambo's for old people. Ah, we'll make the gulab jamun, those are round dessert balls, huge, and call the restaurant Big Balls. Decor, we can save, cheap posters of Gen Z performers. And we can name dishes and drinks after them, like Beyonce Biryani and the Taylor Swift cocktail. It gets you drunk swiftly. We'll bring in live music. I know I can convince Gen Z bands to do it for exposure to their target market. Plus, it's a date magnet. Servers, I'll visit a few malls and hire away some good cell phone salesmen, offering them commission on appetizers, drinks, high-priced entrees, and desserts. To help them and myself, I'll have tabletop tents for appetizers, drinks, and desserts. Our plates are stupid. Yeah, they're hand-painted from India, but the rims are narrow. That means you got to put more food on the plate to make it look full enough. I'll steal a lesson from frou-frou restaurants, ultra-wide rim plates, and in white, so the contrast with the food's color makes it look like there's more food on the plate. And no more free naan. And I'll charge a lot for it. I don't want them filling up on bread. I want them to pay for big-ticket high-margin items, the drinks, the appetizers, the entrees, the dessert. To further discourage naan while saving money, no more making it fresh in a tandoor, store-bought, and thrown in a microwave. It took too long for Dad to make the dishes to order, so I'm going to use canned sauces. They're not bad. I'll have the cook put the cans in the back in pla black plastic bags in the dumpster in the back of a frou, frou Italian restaurant. I once saw a bunch of empty cans of canned sauce. I don't want my customers to see that. But using canned sauce, I need to get Dad out of the kitchen. He'll be furious. Maybe I could do it if I flatter him by saying he'd be a great maitre d'. Nah, wrong demographic. I use hot college girls. I got to get him to work in the back office. He said he'd give me three months to do it my way. Okay, on to publicity. I'll make funny 30-second videos on TikTok and Insta, like holding up the big balls. Also, organic is hot, so I'll say, we love organic. That doesn't mean it needs to be 100% organic. Maybe just some organic spices will do. I'm not allowed to solicit Yelp or Google reviews, but I can get around that. I'll tell the servers that whenever a customer praises the restaurant, to give them a card I'll print up. On one side, we'll have a Gen Z-oriented riddle like, when does one and one equal three? When you don't use a condom. On the back, the card will say, we're loved on Yelp and Google. That'll get the point across without our soliciting reviews. I'll need media reviews, so I'll research all the main restaurant reviewers and find out their hot button. For example, if I see one who also reviews weed, I'll send them a joint of Primo Stuff. 
Not so much that it seems like a bribe, but enough to make them laugh, feel good about me, and come review the restaurant. I am going to use DoorDash, Grubhub, and Uber Eats. I'll hire some kid to go to nearby office buildings, go to each office and offer to leave takeout menus with the receptionist. I'll start with moderate prices, but raise them as soon as I can. Not only does the public foolishly assume that higher price means better food, the bigger profit is going to get me a higher price when I sell the business, which I will do as soon as business starts to level off. VJ fought nearly all of that, the bodlerizing of his ethnically crafted restaurant, but Subaj kept reminding him of their deal. Three months. It didn't happen within three months, but six months later, Subaj got his father to agree to sell big balls to Restaurant Holdings Group, Inc., which promised we'll have the restaurant honor VJ's legacy while maintaining Subaj's modern approach. But a year later, Restaurant Holding Group, Inc. gutted VJ's restaurant to the studs and replaced it with the newest hot restaurant concept. Anyway, that story is called Big Balls. I'm just going to get a little drink. Next story is called Tits Tommy. Tommy was always disliked because he was a know-it-all. He couldn't help it. He was smart and not restrained enough to hide it, so the kids hated him. He tried to compensate by being ever so nice. He was careful not to hurt anyone's feelings. He did all sorts of favors for kids, even though they were rarely reciprocated. Indeed, the nicer Tommy was, the more the kids took him for a patsy. They felt fine about ignoring him, asking him for more favors, and treating him insensitively, even cruelly. For example, as a preteen, he got chubby, and the kids called him Tits Tommy. He responded as his parents in church taught him, turn the other cheek. Alas, that was seen as a sign of weakness, so the taunts grew into getting beaten up for mock offenses like, why are you looking at my girlfriend? In high school, Tommy decided that the way to attract girls was to be polite, tactful, and buy a little presence and be respectful of sexual reticence. The popular girls saw that as unattractive. The only girl who liked him was Rita, who, because she wasn't attractive, was starving for kindness. Despite seeing again and again that being nice yields less respect, Tommy went through life being Mr. Nice Guy perhaps because he was wired that way or because he felt it was worth the abuse in exchange for doing what's right. But even Tommy's wife and children took advantage of him. The nicer he was, the more indifferent, indeed more disrespectful they were of him. He tried hard to please them, and increasingly, with ever greater confidence, they treated his wants as irrelevant. So as Tommy aged, he grew more dispirited. I just don't fit on this earth. Alas, unlike in the movies, he never met anyone who treasured him for his kindness nor was he rewarded by his employers or society. Tommy was nice even to the nurse who injected him with the euthanasia drug. Perhaps the only time he showed strength was in his will. He left all his assets to charity. That story is called Tits Tommy. Next story is called Just When You Feel Safest. Jen was the smartest one in the room. At most staff meetings, she had the best ideas, often topping others' suggestions. The unfortunate, as you'll see, very unfortunate side effect is she made others feel less than, a no-no in today's workplace. So when a restructuring resulted in three of the team losing their jobs, they couldn't help but think that Jen's showing off contributed. One day, Jen was at her desk, the place she felt most comfortable, and a plastic bomb that had been placed under her keyboard exploded, giving her first-degree burns on her hands. Wrapped in aluminum foil was a note, remember Psycho? She felt safest until there she was stabbed to death. Restructure yourself out of a job or else. The police took the usual report and investigated, of course, interviewing the three laid-off workers, but all had solid alibis. In fact, one of them had hired one of the janitors to do the dirty work. In a week, the case joined the 95% that ended up in the cold case file. Two months passed, and Jen, having refused to quit her good job, was relaxed driving home. She had long felt her car was what she called my island of sanity. The peace was broken, though, when a bomb that had been placed in the seat back pocket exploded, burning and wrenching her back. A foil-wrapped nose said, quit your job or else, and the investigation turned up nothing. A year later, in the shower, the shower head exploded, bloodying her face. This time, Jen quit, but despite her being the smartest one in the room, she couldn't land a decent job. During the interviews, she'd be asked, Why'd you leave your previous job? She wanted to answer honestly, and the interviewer's response inevitably would be something like, well, won't this person do it to you again? And Jen remained unemployed for a year and scared. So that, that story is just when you feel safest. 
The next story is called A Psychiatrist's Last Hour. The patient sobbed, Thank you for understanding how tough it's been for me since she died. I thought it's been a year and it's been a rat and it's a rabbit. Every time I think about moving forward, I think of carrots and I cry. I understand. Unfortunately, we're out of time for today. Is there anything else you want to, anything you want to remember from today's session? I don't know, Dr. Michaels. Is it normal to grieve so long? I would have liked to ask, might that be an excuse to keep, look, to keep from looking for a job? But I felt he would just get defensive, so I just said, we all process differently. For homework, is there anything you'd like to try? I should try to get a job, and this time I will. I doubted it. Uh, can you refill my prescription? It's time to cut down to 10 milligrams. I really need 20. I'm so stressed, Dr. Michaels, please. I was too tired to fight. All right, the last prescription at 20. Oh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Michaels. See you next week, and the client strode out. I bowed my head. When I got home, I stared at my front door. Why is that door so ornate? Who am I trying to impress? On opening the door, I got my usual warm welcome from my doggy Tarzan, who leaped not through trees but onto me. When I dropped into my recliner, Tarzan on my lap, I thought, why do I do all this? Killed myself in school, in college, in med school, in residency, and work really hard now. I don't feel I'm making much difference. Why have I done it all? So I can live in a nice place? What does it all mean? Does it mean anything? Oh, I have to appeal, uh, have to appeal those denials of coverage. Excuse me, Tarzan. Then I shuffled to my desk. He followed and rested his head on my foot. While writing to Etna, Tarzan vomited a grass-filled blob, and I sighed, huh, dog parenthood. I blotted, rinsed, repeat, sprayed, washed hands, and returned to begging Edna. But Tarzan vomited again the next day, so it was off to the vet. That says probably nothing. I asked, no need for tests? Eh, it's not worth the discomfort and expense of an endoscopy. You're a doc, you know. Most times it's a horse, not a zebra. But the next two days, Tarzan kept vomiting, and without the reassuring grass. The vet said, I still think it's nothing, but let's do the endoscopy. All normal. I'm sure Tarzan will be fine when the results came, when the results did come in. But two more days of vomiting, and I made an appointment with a specialist vet. The first opening was two weeks out. David, there is a lesion here. Somehow the other vet missed it. We should do a whole body scan. The result was stage four. And I said, thank you, doctor. At least now I know. Back home, I cradled Tarzan. I won't sue the first vet. I've mis made mistakes, too. Finding my shaking hand, I opened my book safe, pulled out the fentanyl vial, and helped my best friend avoid end-stage cancer's pain. I filled the syringe again, this time completely, put it aside, and wrote, Dear fellow psychiatrists, I worried my way through life, stressed my way through life, to try to become a decent psychiatrist. I traded most pleasure for accomplishment. I do not think it was worth it. It may be that I wasn't a good enough psychiatrist, but it seems that many of us don't accomplish enough for all our time, brains, and effort. Too often our drugs and procedures are mere palliatives. They're like adding more oil to a smoking car engine. They help only for a while, and the engine still often blows. It's no shame to leave psychiatry. Don't throw more good time and effort after bad. Even being a good cafe owner will likely bring more pleasure to your customers and employees just use your good brain and drive and be kind. Now I'll put myself at peace. When David didn't show up at work, nor answer his page, his boss, the hospital's chief of psychiatry, called the police, which found David and the note. The officer sent it to David's boss, who posted it on websites for aspiring psychiatrists. Anyway, that essay is called The Psychiatrist's Last Hour. This one is called You Don't Want to Know. The old saw is that you don't want to know how sausages or laws are made. Tim learned something else he wished he hadn't known. Tim was afraid of death, even as a toddler. He thought that if his mother called the doctor, it spelled doom. At age 10, Tim calculated that he already used up 15% of his life, and he spent many sleepless nights worrying. At age 50, he sent a DNA sample to a genome analysis company, not because he wanted to know his risk factors, but because he wanted to contribute to science's understanding of genetics. He checked the box that said that he doesn't want to see the results, but a glitch resulted his, in his seeing them. Although at Tim's wellness exams, his doctor said he was fine, his genome analysis indicated he was at risk of an early heart attack. That catapulted Tim into ongoing terror and vigilance. Every sensation that could even remotely presage heart disease scared him, 
and he often rushed to the doctor for reassurance or he feared confirmation. Each time the doctor gave him good news, and yet at 64, he had a heart attack. Tim's fear resumed, greater than ever, but little by little it was impossible even for Tim to remain ever on high alert, and he eventually was able to live with only moderate ongoing anxiety. He decided to journal about his fears and concluded there was no answer but to try to squeeze as much pleasure and contribution from each moment. In case that story is you don't want to know. The next story is called Who Can You Trust? Of course I want to trust the science, but a while back the New York Times reported that the consensus among climate science was that Earth was in a long-term cooling trend. Now they insist we're in a long-term warming trend. When they told us back in 2018 we'd have self-driving cars by 2022, I was excited. But now they say it's at least a decade away. But what really got to me was when the scientists insisted we only we had to lock down because of COVID, and only after society was decimated they admit it was a bad idea. So I started to wonder, if I can't trust the science, who can I trust? Well, let's start at the top. I remember Sister Mary Ignatius citing Matthew 17 to 20. If you have faith the side of a mustard size of a mustard seed, just a bit of faith in God, you will say to the mountain, move from here to there and it'll move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Well, I haven't even moved molehills. I'm still a mere functionary at the water utility, and I just lost my dad to cancer after years of misery. Trust in a loving God? Then there was my singing teacher. She told me that if I stayed with it and worked hard, I had professional potential. Well, I stayed with it and worked hard till I was 25, and the most I ever got for a gig was 75 bucks. I probably spent 100 times that on singing lessons. Mostly, I sang at open mic nights for free. Then when I was 30, I had finally saved some money. A friend told me that he had done well using a financial advisor in Sacramento. I invested most of my savings. It turned out it was a Ponzi scheme and I lost everything. At my previous job, after a layoff, my boss told us the survivors, your jobs are safe. Within three months, dozens of us got axed. Then there was my ex-husband. He insisted, I love you, I love you, until he decided he was sick of me, and worse, in the divorce dog fight, had a, hit a bunch of money by having his aunt hold it for him. I only found out after the divorce decree. Now I have to hire the lawyer again and go back to court. Then there were the politicians. George Bush insisted, read my lips, no new taxes, and then raise taxes. Barack Obama said, under Obamacare, you can keep your doctor. Not. Now our government says our border is secure, yet I see videos of thousands traipsing over the border. As a good liberal, I donated to Black Lives Matter but recently read that $90 million was missing, unaccounted for. They since found, since found $10 million of it. A founder is accused of, quote, using it as a personal piggy bank. I believed in socialism until I read the book The White Pill. It reports that Stalin killed more than 20 million people, four times as many as Hitler, and killed his own people, mainly by deliberate starvation. Thousands of Soviet people were even reduced to cannibalism. I love the socialist ideal, but can I really trust the leaders? That even, that even the people will be any different than in the communist countries to date? On the other hand, I don't trust conservatives, let alone Donald Trump. So who can I trust? I sort of trust myself, but too often don't have the right answers. And even when I do, I don't always implement them, witness the extra 20 pounds around my hips. I still sort of trust scientists, at least the hard scientists, not the public policy ones. They are too subject to politicians' influence. I have the most trust in physicists, chemists, mathematicians, computer scientists, Trouble is I don't know any, so when I hear some new health recommendation, I usually ask myself if it makes common sense. I remember when the lockdown mandate occurred. I asked my doctor what he thought. He said it wouldn't work, that when we're out and about, we get harmless microexposures to all sorts of viruses, which builds natural resistance. But if we're locked down, we don't. So when we come out of isolation, we're more subject to infection. That made sense to me, and it turns out he was right. Now there's an explosion of respiratory synctial virus. RSV, before I'd never even heard of RSV. Another hard scientist I trust is the meteorologist. It seems that the weather forecasts are ever more accurate. I just Googled it and it's true. Today's five-day forecast is as accurate as a one-day forecast in 1980. Thank a hard scientist. I was listening to the Portal podcast and the host, Eric Weinstein, had come to the conclusion that the only entity he can trust is Trader Joe's. Could he have been only half joking? In any case, um, that's, that short story is called Who Can You Trust? The next story is called Adam's Legacy. Adam had terminal cancer, but it hadn't advanced enough that his doctor would prescribe the death with dignity pills. So while Adam still felt strong enough, he took the gun that he had bought many years ago for home security, drove with a shovel to a very remote field, 
stopped at a young oak tree where his remains would fertilize him. Slowly, a bit at a time, which was the best that Adam could do, he dug a hole next to the tree. Then he refilled it with the soil and leaves, climbed in, putting the shovel next to him so it wouldn't be found, and covered himself fully with that soil mix. He put the gun into his mouth, just right, pointing to the roof of his mouth, and with the confidence of knowing he was doing the wise thing, crisply pulled the trigger and died almost instantly and painlessly. The brain doesn't have nerve endings. Adam's remains indeed fed the tree, so it grew well and soon produced acorns, which in turn produced oak trees. And the process repeated and repeated and repeated, until many years hence the field had become a forest. Then one day a group of adventurous kids explored deep in the forest and uncovered Adam's bones. Cool, they all agreed. And when they returned home, they told their friends about their amazing find. And when they grew up, they told the story to their children. One of them created a Christmas tradition of walking everyone into the forest, lighting a campfire, and telling that true scary story. And thus, Adam's legacy was ensured. Uh, that story is called Adam's Legacy. The next story is called How the World Ends and Begins Again. Under pressure from the world media, Iran finally elected a more liberal government. To prove it was still tough, it gave more money and weapons to Israel's adjacent enemies, Syria and Lebanon, and to groups committed to destroying Israel, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, ISIS Sinai, Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, and Hamas. In an attempt to preempt attacks, Israel fired a fusillade of missiles at the, all of the above. Iran used that unprovoked attack to solicit military funding and weaponry from Russia and then from China. The U.S. remained committed to brokering a negotiated solution and ruled out military involvement, remembering the lessons of Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Ukraine. But talks quickly broke down, and when Iran, now well-funded, decided it would do better negotiating from strength, it bombed Haifa, Israel's port and third largest city, killing hundreds, mainly port workers. While the European Union remained mostly silent, the U.S., along with the U.K., felt it must act, despite protests from the now-enlarged squad. U.S. and U.K. involvement grew as it became clear that the Iran-Russia-China triumvirate was emboldened by the West's modest response. It then bombed, with conventional and chemical weapons, Israel's two largest cities, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Then at 3 a.m. on Yom Kippur, the Jews' most solemn holiday, the triumvirate fired a nuclear bomb into the heart of Israel, destroying all of the tiny country's buildings, 90% of its people immediately, and the under 10% would likely soon die from radiation poisoning. At that point, the U.S. and the U.K., with modest support from NATO, launched a retaliatory nuclear strike against the Iran-Russia-China triumvirate. It was supposed to be tactical only on military targets, but errors resulted in a nuke devastating St. Petersburg, Russia, and another one in Chengdu, China, both population centers. That triggered additional nuclear attacks by both sides, and thus the world essentially ended. A tattered United Nations met in the basement of the United Nations building, the above ground part had been destroyed, and agreed it would restart the world with um, a one world, largely socialist government. They agreed that climate change, a long-term but not immediate threat, would be put on the back burner, but almost immediately, a capitalist group decided to splinter and the former India gave it land. And so it all began again. So that story is how the world ends and begins again. The next story is called Waiting for the Answer. When I graduated from an Ivy, everyone was happy. When right out of college I got hired as an HR management trainee, everyone was happy. When I married Todd, everyone was happy. Our Christmas cards portrayed the happy family. And then we got divorced and no one was happy. I got to keep the house, but despite a good alimony and child support deal, to afford the mortgage and everything, I needed to come out of retirement after six years and get a job. Of course, I was scared that the gap in employment could be a deal killer. Ironically, rather than that motivating me to do a thorough job search, it made me procrastinate. But when the Dunning notices from the bank got more and more scary, I channeled my fear into getting super prepared for job interviews. I primped my resume. I even kept playing with the space between lines, and I settled on two points. I hired an interview coach especially to help me concoct a good answer for why you've been out of work so long. I knew that it probably wouldn't work to say that being a domestic engineer will make me a better HR manager. We practiced on video until I sounded smooth and confident. Then I applied and applied and applied. The usual response was no response, or at best a thanks but no thanks. We had many qualified applicants, blah, blah, blah. Then I finally got an interview. Yeah, it was only a screening interview, and it was only on Zoom, but it was an interview. 
Again, I prepped my ass off. For example, I read a lot about the organization Save the Whales. I loved that it was an environmental nonprofit, and I studied not just HR issues, but even about whales. Did you know that the male humpback whales sing songs in Hawaiian waters that can last 20 minutes and be heard miles away? Not only did I feel I did well in the interview, the interviewer said I did too. So I was excited. Of course, I knew that other applicants would be called for the real interview, but still. I let my optimism rationalize my stopping applying for other jobs. I hated applying. So much effort when it mainly yields just silence or a form letter rejection. But a week went by then too. Was my gap, in fact, a deal killer? I deliberated. When should I follow up? Too soon and I seemed desperate. Too late and maybe, uh, maybe I'd fallen through the cracks and they were about to hire someone else. I decided to email two weeks plus one day after my interview. And I waited a day, then another. Now despondent and desperate, I phoned. It took a half dozen calls to get to the right person, but finally I did. And she said, oh, we only contact candidates who get to the next round. I went inert. I couldn't motivate myself to send out more applications. My ex-husband and even my parents think I'm being lazy. In any case, that story is waiting for an answer. Uh, the next story is called Wonder Woman. I hate that I had reached the mandatory retirement age for National Park Police, 57. I still feel young, love my job, my coworkers, the park visitors, and most of all, that my office was Yellowstone National Park. Yeah, I have a pension, but now I spend too much time pacing, pacing my house, pacing my backyard, pacing the park. So I was glad to be invited to my granddaughter Chloe's second birthday party. What gift to buy? My daughter said that Chloe likes music, so I found a toy piano for toddlers on Amazon. Just eight keys, but it can make the sound of an electric piano, an organ, even a DJ scratcher. But after Chloe tore open the gift wrapping, she patted, I wanted Wonder Woman. When I asked whether she wanted to try the piano, she shook her head. To try to entice her, I plunked out the only song I knew, Mary had a Little Lamb, but she turned away. Grandparents spoil, so I said, okay, I'll get you Wonder Woman, Chloe, and I bought the cheapest one I could find. I kept the toy piano because it was a hassle to ship it back to Amazon. I'd occasionally trial and error plunk out other simple songs like Old MacDonald and Row, Row, Row Your Boat. Then I wrote words uh, to them about what I know, parks, cops, even an anti-drug PSA, and posted them on YouTube. When I next visited Chloe, I bought the little piano and played my ditties for her, yes, in part to show her what she missed. She said, I want it. I asked, where's Wonder Woman? She replied, I don't know. Anyway, that story is called Wonder Woman. Next story is called Burn. I always had a short fuse. My father nicknamed me Burn. My parents are the opposite, quiet, calm. I not only loved but respected my parents, in part because I wish I had their personality. That love and respect, plus my liking still living with them, and to be honest, being a little scared to go away from college, go to away college, made me wonder if I should just go to the local commuter college. But I did go away, in part because I was curious about the lifetime friendships the college's marketing touted. But my experience in the dorm made that unlikely. I couldn't stand all the silliness, partying hard in the middle of the week, many kids drunk or stoned, a fair amount in between, and trade sex, that was kids' terms for everyone screwing everyone. I found it all lazy, and the fancy word I learned in college, dissolute. Actually, I felt angry about it all, at them, at the college's marketing BS, and even at myself for not fitting in. At Christmas, I told my parents I was thinking of transferring to a commuter college. They urged me to give it another try. I agreed, but insisted that they let me live in an apartment, and they agreed as long as I took a part-time job to help pay for it. During the Christmas holiday, more than they ever had, my parents went into detail about why my mother left the house in the middle of the night twice. The cops had called to say her story had been arsoned. The cops said that the community doesn't like Asian businesses in their neighborhood. Then my dad talked about what it was really like for his grandparents in the Japanese internment camps in World War II. He tried to understand it all, including my own reactions and my own personality. I majored in psychology. And while I had doubts about the power of professors' explanation for people's malaise, such as family of origin, trauma, and sociological influences, I bought it well enough to stay with the major. And because afterwards I preferred more school to getting a job, I applied and got into an all the way through a PhD program in clinical psychology. But I found those theories didn't help my clients much. Yeah, my clients got more insight into themselves, but too rarely was their life much better. As often, the therapy made them feel like victims. They tended to blame their problems mainly on things outside their control. Worse, too many stayed focused on their past rather than on moving forward. I sometimes felt angry at them and more often at my training. 
I knew I needed a new career. I thought about taking my dad's advice and going back for a computer science degree, but couldn't make myself do it. I wanted to be my own man, so I tried a variation. I went to a video game design boot camp, but no one would hire me except as a $15 an hour game tester, boring and dead end. What have I decided to do? Drive an ice cream truck. At least that's something I believe in, and I make every customer happy. Today, my parents threatened to disown me, and in anger on my phone, in front of them, I made a YouTube of me burning my PhD diploma. In any case, that uh, short, short story is called Burn. The next story is called The Hillcrest Widows Club. The four women of the Hillcrest Widow Club met every Thursday morning at 9 in the corner of a quiet shop, coffee shop. Their statements about their deceased husbands started politely. For example, Mary said, yes, it's difficult, but I'm trying to muddle through. But slowly, their fear of being seen as cold faded. But what really opened things up was when Zoe said, honestly, I'm relieved to get rid of that ball and chain. Brittany then feel, felt free to pile on. Don't we like talking with each other more than with men? We care more about family, feelings, and okay fashion. The successful men mainly want to talk about their work, the unsuccessful ones about sports. Further emboldened, Zoe said, and they just care about getting in and out, assuming they can get it up, which for the last decade my husband at least couldn't. And I had to pretend it was okay. Two of the other women nodded. That encouraged Zoe to admit that she had fantasies about lesbian sex. Okay, more than fantasies. Before long, they decided they needed more privacy. So they met in Zoe's plush living room. Mary asked, how could you afford this? Zoe replied, my husband was a lawyer who had one client, but a great one, the Environmental Protection Agency. After a glass of wine and or a bong hit, Zoe moved close to Willow, the member who seemed most likely to be willing to kiss. Zoe looked her in the eye, and when Willow didn't avert, Zoe kissed her as the others watched wide-eyed. Would Willow pull back? On the contrary, she sighed in pleasure. But Zoe sensed it was too fast, not just for Willow, but for the others. So Zoe pulled back and asked if someone would like another hit or a glass of wine. But three Zoe meetings later, they all, and I mean all, had a very cuddly experience. But after, Mary whispered something that shocked the others. I love our widow's club, but every so often I wonder, are men so bad that we're fine with bashing them? We wouldn't criticize women, let alone BIPOCs. If I did, I'd get the three C's, censure, censor, or cancel. Atop that, in so many news shows, especially movies, TV shows, novels, a spunky, smart woman usually triumphs over an evil or clueless guy. And yet when women have the deficit, say we're so-called underrepresented in science, there's massive redress and, yes, reverse discrimination. I know a number of women who got jobs over more competent, harder-working guys. Okay, so did I. Yet when men have the ultimate deficit, they live five years shorter than women, their last decade in worse health, and there are 4.4 .4 widows for every widower, all we see is another run for breast cancer. Over the next few meetings, the others began to shun Mary. It was subtle, a little less eye contact, a little more interrupting, and unlike before, no one asked her to get together between meetings. Sad at being ostracized, Mary figured, it's not that big a deal to play the game. She even told anti-male jokes. What do you call a man with half a brain? Gifted. What's the difference between government bonds and men? Bonds mature. What's the difference between a man and a catfish? One is a bottom-feeding scum sucker and the other is a fish. And soon, Mary was back in the fold. Now that story is called uh, the uh, Hillcrest Widows Club. Uh, the next story is called Merit. Merit. My mother always told me that merit will always trump all. Your father and I immigrated from Japan and look at us. And for a while, merit did trump all. Although I was a Japanese-American immigrant, I got great grades and kids liked me. Plus, I got into what is called a highly selective college. Quietly, I was proud of myself. But in the required ethnic studies course and then in other courses, I was told that my pride need be restrained because I was privileged, not earned privileged, privileged. I was told that black, Latinx, and Native Americans remain the victims of systemic racism and oppression. I asked one professor, I don't feel like I'm prejudiced. She said, you suffer from unconscious bias. After all, if you're on a dark street and you see an African American and a Japanese American, wouldn't you be more scared of the African American? I murmured yes, but didn't quite see that as an unfair bias, but I guess I was starting to. After all, I did get hired as an engineer by a quality company. They paid me well. Good benefits, provided training. Very few blacks, Latinxes, and Native Americans did. 
And so much in the news and entertainment media portrays BIPOCs as victims who triumph only because of superior ability or spunk. Could they be all wrong and, and little my parents and I be right? And when we took the required diversity, equity, and inclusion training, I was feeling so guilty that I cried in the session. The leader then asked me if I'd like to become on the hiring, to be on the hiring committee. I felt taken up by the cause of social justice and believed that increasing not just equality but equity required giving preference to BIPOC candidates. So whenever I could, I voted for and later championed BIPOC candidates, even when it was a job I wanted. I didn't really stop to think about the more qualified candidates who got rejected, the coworkers who would be saddled with less able or hardworking employees, or the customers who got a worse product or service. I somehow just thought of it as reparations. But overall, I feel good for giving up some of my privilege. And I look forward to oppressed people getting cash reparations from the taxpayer. I had long been afraid to tell my mother about my evolved views, but one day after work I did, she simply said, you're wrong. America is wrong. Now let's have dinner. So uh, anyway, that's, that story is called Merit. The next story is called Pillow Talk. For months, I had been procrastinating telling my wife. And if she hadn't said, what's wrong, really, I might not have not been able to blurt it out. I said, I'm seeing someone. I was sure she was going to explode. I was wrong. Almost like she was glad she said, I had no idea. I mean, you showed none of the telltale signs. No late night working, no better mood, no lipstick on the collar. I replied, you don't seem upset. It's not that I'm seeing someone also. It's, well, I guess I'm just tired of married life and all the debates. What do you mean? I mean, we're both smart and can get sucked into using our brains to debate like politics, race, class, gender. You with your scientist brain, me with my sociologist brain, and my heart. Who is she? The librarian in the bioengineering library. Is it just a fling or do you want to leave? I wasn't sure. I said, I think leave. Not necessarily for her, although, ironically, I appreciate that she doesn't argue. She's agreeable, kind, even generous. I'm generous with money. I had hit a sore spot, so she changed the topic. Now what? I don't know. Can we talk about it in the morning? She replied, I won't be able to sleep. What do you want to do? Maybe nothing for a while? Then she shocked me. There's someone I've been curious about. My eyes widened. Really? Tell me about him. Her. Anyway, that story is called Pillow Talk. The next story is, would you stop procrastinating for a million dollars? Because I'm unemployed, I'm still living in my grandfather's house. I thought he wouldn't be home for a few hours, so even though it was a weekday when I should have been job hunting, I was practicing shooting my pistol in the backyard. To keep me focused, right next to the target paper, I had nailed my Army Marksman's medal. When my grandfather saw me playing with my pistol instead of, instead of job hunting, he was angry with me yet again. Devin, you're a good tax accountant. All you're missing is discipline. I tried to help you by pushing you to go to West Point. You learned accounting there, but you didn't learn discipline. He paced the backyard and continued, Devin, I've written my will, and I have about a million dollars, and made you the beneficiary. But I can't feel good about it if you're such a procrastinator. So here's the deal. It's March 2nd. If you can complete my tax return, federal, state, and city, by midnight April 15th, the tax deadline, the will will stand. If not, I'll change it so the mil million goes to charity. The million was motivating, absolutely. And I worked hard at it, and by April 12th, it was almost done. I had completed the federal and state returns and just had to polish the city, a few hours of work max. That day, my girlfriend called to say that she had just gotten a bonus and wanted to take us to her favorite hideaway for the weekend. Because I had just a few hours left to work on the taxes, I agreed, and we had a great time. When we got back on the night of the 14th, I was exhausted, so I went to sleep and set the alarm for 8 a.m., which would give me more than enough time to get the taxes done by midnight. When I woke up, I got coffee, went right to the computer, opened the software and all the files. All the files, the federal, the state, the city were empty, gone. I couldn't stop shrieking, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. My grandfather rushed in and I explained what happened and he fumed. How could you be so irresponsible? Didn't you make a backup? I hadn't. I didn't even know how to make a backup with tax software. I mean, I'd never lost any file in my entire life. He said he was sorry, but the million's going to go to charity. 
In agony, I went to my girlfriend's apartment. She cried, too. I assumed in sympathy, but she explained. Remember that bonus I told you I got? Well, it came from your grandfather, who gave it to me in exchange for luring you away so he could delete the files without your catching him. He told me that he always intended to give the money to charity. He was afraid you'd sue to overturn the will, but if you didn't keep your part of the bargain to get the taxes done in time, you wouldn't sue. I swore to him I'd keep that secret, mainly because giving to charity seemed so kind, but Devin, I had to tell you, I love you. I raced out of the house, got my pistol, and shot my grandfather to death. As with most murders, this one went unsolved, and the million went to me, whereupon I decided, for a while at least, I didn't need to look for a job. In any case, that story is called Would You Stop Procrastinating for a Million Dollars? The next story is called Taxed. Jaime didn't think it would last. He would last the seven more years until retirement. It wasn't just the cacophony of middle school band. <clears throat> it was the ever-changing rules. One year, the district mandate was that 25% of the music be world music. The next year, it was that 10% world music plus 20% composers from underrepresented groups. And this year, the percentage was up to 30%. It's challenging. Rules were often contradictory. The principal wanted more Asian music to reflect the school's population, but that would make it harder to meet the district mandate. So Jaime was thinking of taking early retirement, even if it meant he wouldn't get the full retirement package. A month ago on a Friday afternoon, Jaime dropped into his car and noticed that it, not only was he nearly out of gas, so was his car. He could barely muster the energy to stop at the gas station, and seeing the price, $6 a gallon, made him want to just pull away, but he forced himself to put 20 bucks in. Alas, his credit card was declined, so he trudged to the window to pay in cash. Behind the window, window were tickets for the lottery games, the Daily Five, the Fantasy Five, Super Lotto, Mega Millions, and Powerball. He lamented such a regressive tax. The poor buy most of the lottery tickets. But then he thought, I know it's one in a zillion, but if I won the lottery, I could quit. The next big payout game was Super Lotto. So as much to soothe his anxiety about seven more years of a cacophony, he bought a ticket. And Jaime won, not $50 or even $5,000. He won the Super Lotto Grand Prize, $11,756,363. He soon discovered that even if he spread the payout over 25 years, he'd still lose half in income taxes, federal, state, and city. So he took it in a lump after taxes $5,112,324. He decided that putting it in a money market or bank CD was too conservative. After all, the $5 million was just found money. He also decided that America is precarious, so he divided the money among an India ETF and a California tax-free bond fund, reasoning that the feds would never let California go under. Before Jaime could take the time to decide whether to quit his job, he received friendly calls from relatives. The sophisticated ones didn't ask for money. They figured that congratulating him would make them prominent in his mind without his thinking they were after his money. But none of them were poor, and so Jaime thought he would do more good by donating the money to charity. But each time he investigated a nonprofit, he found something troubling. Most of the reputable charities had executives with big salaries. How caring could they be if they take so much money rather than having it go to the needy? Or too high a percentage of the funds went to administration and fundraising? Or there was a scandal like deceptive advertising or even misappropriation of funds? So Jaime decided to keep one million for himself and then did something that everyone thinks is crazy. He gave the rest to the IRS. Inefficient though government is, he couldn't find a charity that was clearly better. Did Jaime quit his job? He concluded that the short school days, short school year, guaranteed job security, full benefits including pension, plus all he had learned about teaching made it worth staying. But what he did do was give $100,000 to his school district's foundation, earmarking it for the drama program. He knew that they would then ask if he wanted anything in return. He requested a transfer to a high school that had many students who were taking private music lessons. No surprise, Jaime's request was granted. One day, as Jaime drove home from his new job, he thought, I won the lottery, ethically gave most of it away, and got a better job. I'm still not jumping up and down. Why? In any case, that story is called Taxed. The next story is called, and it may be the last one, it may probably, I don't think so. It's called Hide. I've always been reluctant to show my feelings. For example, I tried to remain expressionless when kids were choosing sides for softball and I got picked later than I thought I deserved to be. But what my sister did to me made me swear I'd never show my feelings again. 
One night, when the dog in the movie we were watching died, I cried a lot. When she asked why, I explained that it wasn't just that the dog died, it's that I'm scared, you no, know, terrified of dying. My sister is two years older than I, and so, um, and so she soon became sophisticated enough to push my buttons. She'd say things like, after you die, you can never come back, never. You'll just get eaten by worms. And most people don't die peacefully, they die screaming. I just tried to suppress those thoughts, but she wouldn't let me. She taunted me all the time, enjoying seeing me get teary. Worse, she made sure the fear remained top of mind. For example, one evening, I came into my bedroom to find that she had etched the words worms and screaming into my bed's wooden headboard. So as I grew up, I made sure to, for example, never show a woman how much I cared for her. I was afraid she'd use my caring to extract what she wanted from me, expensive gifts, fancy vacations, and so on. So it's no surprise that I never married. I did the same at work. For example, I got a promotion, but was afraid that if I showed joy, they'd think I didn't deserve the promotion, or they'd think they could underpay me, or, and it was probably irrational, my jealous former supervisees would more likely try to sabotage me. I even showed nothing when I got my cancer diagnosis, a death sentence. The doctor even said, you seem to be taking it in stride. Inside I was terrified, but said only, well, we all have to go sometime. I told no one about the cancer. Not only did I not want to burden anyone with it, if they did something nice for me, I'd feel I'd have to reciprocate and didn't have the energy. Again, probably irrational, but I wanted to tell you my truth. The only way my sister found out is that when I collapsed, vomiting blood, I had to call 911, and in the hospital, they looked in my wallet and saw that my sister was listed as next of kin. She asked, why didn't you tell me? For a rare time, I smiled and said, you think about it. In any case, uh, that, call, that short story is called Hide. The next one is called I'm Committing Suicide in the Most Painful Way. The only kids who like me are the skanky girls. They like my black leather jacket that I have a red car and that I smoke. Yeah, we, but cancer sticks too. They're morons. Why do I smoke? Yeah, it's cool. And yeah, even if it kills me, that's like forever away. I mean, I just like smoking. I like lighting a cigarette, putting it in my mouth, seeing the smoke, washing the ash get longer. I mean, it's not like I smoke camel, no filter, just Marlboro. So I'm walking home from school, actually walking home from cutting. I only went to three classes, art, drama, and homeroom. I did that so my mother wouldn't get the call from the attendance officer. I'm minding my own business when this old guy stops me. Son, why would you want to kill yourself? And he points at a cigarette. None of your fucking business. Go away, old man, and die. It's, not, it's your time, not mine. Son, you've chosen the most painful way to commit suicide. Trust me, I know. I lost my wife to cancer, cigarette smoker. For weeks, she was in such bad pain that morphine couldn't cut it. She was screaming the entire time until she died. We both were grateful, and she was only 45. You'll be 45 before you know it. That shut me up, and I slunk away. When he couldn't see me, I gave the rest of the pack to a kid I passed who was smoking. Why am I killing myself? Because I have nothing to live for. I ain't going to get a career in artificial intelligence like the stupid career counselor tells us where the jobs will be. I can't attract a girl who isn't a walking STD dispenser. My mother hates me, and I don't blame her. So I bought another pack. Okay. Um, next story is called uh, Tom. I think it's the last one. Yeah, I think it is. By 2040, the dystopians have been proven wrong. Jobs lost to automation have been replaced, not mainly by new jobs, but because of the 12,000 mile per hour nuclear powered flying car. It can take off from any parking spot and go halfway around the world in an hour or less. So everyone can find a job with a reasonable commute, even if they live in the U.S. and the job is in China. Marriage, that practice that usually ended up in divorce or in schlepping through life, had become unpopular, replaced by flexible pacts. Childbirth has become easy, and fetal death and childbirth virtually eliminated. How? Because nearly all moms choose to have their babies by curated embryo in vitro fertilization, and to gestate their baby in an incubator. School, which had been notorious for producing too little learning and too much antipathy, has been replaced by super courses, the world's most transformational teachers giving interactive, individualized, gamified lessons online. Translated into 70 languages and available on smartphones, super courses enable every child, grade four through college, rich and poor from Alabama to Zululand, to learn 
to previously unthinkable heights enjoyably. Recreation is deeply immersive, thanks to immersion rooms. Each home has one in which all four walls, the ceiling and the floor, are giant screens. Games in the immersion room allow a person or persons to, for example, have adventures while being inside a human body, exploring the world or a world light years away. Gene editing and embryo selection of dramatically reduced cancers, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. That has increased the average health span to 100, at which point most people, rather than decline painfully, take the la-la land pill. Gene editing has prevented depression, but Tom, while not depressed, usually feels empty. His job is to monitor a bank of artificial superintelligence computers to ensure they don't do anything nefarious. But while Tom could pull the plug, he wants to be able to do the less drastic thing, reduce the computer's capability. But Tom's coding skills are, despite prodigious efforts, marginal, so he suffers from the imposter syndrome. Also dispiriting to Tom, the so-called equity amendments to the Constitution. The 37th Amendment, the Equal Pay Amendment, mandates that with few exceptions, everyone must be paid the same, no matter how much they exceed the minimum productivity requirement. While Tom knows that being more than minimally productive is core to the life well led, he can't make himself do more than minimum. The 38th Amendment, the Fair Living Amendment, mandates that residences be no larger than 180 square feet per resident, so a family four of four is limited to 720 square feet. As a result, many people who lived in larger homes or apartments were forced to sell it or rent it to enough people to get down to the 180 per person. The Fair Living Amendment also mandates that the racial and ethnic population in all census tracts be within 10% of proportionality to the local population. So homeowners are forced to pay members of underrepresented groups to move into their census tract. The 39th Amendment, the Racial Compensatory Amendment, requires reparations to African Americans, to Latinos because they were descendants of victims of the Mexican-American War, to Chinese Americans whose ancestors were indentured servitude to build U.S. railroads, and to the descendants of Japanese Americans who in World War II were placed in internment camps. To fund the Racial Compensatory Amendment, all other people are required to give 10% of their income each year until the requirement is scheduled to sunset in 2045. The 40th Amendment, the Fair Partnership Amendment, requires each partner in a romantic relationship to report semi-annually whether their partner did at least 40% of the domestic work. That's a struggle for Tom, not because he doesn't want to do his part, but because he consistently feels drained. After work, he just wants to trudge into the immersion room. Even there, he usually has too little energy to play active games. He just wants to be flown around the various worlds. Tom's first attempt to lift himself from malaise was to use his phone's Sigmund app, an AI-driven virtual therapist that uses machine learning to become ever more effective with each patient. Sigmund helped Tom, but not enough, so Tom tried Rise, the top-rated mood elevation mist, which activates a set of brain neurons and dulls another. The improvements Tom felt from Sigmund and Rise weren't enough to counter the ever more draining effects of his life, especially his imposter syndrome and the four equity amendments. One night, when Tom was too tired to even be flown around the immersion room and too scared to tell his wife about the depths of his sadness, he went to the bedroom and stared at the la-la pill. In any case, um, these are the darkest of the 234 stories in my new book, Soloists, subtitle, 234 short short stories of introverts and outsiders facing a dilemma. As usual, I welcome your thumbs up and accept your thumbs down. I always look forward to your comments and especially like it if you hit the share button below. Share on your social media so that my efforts can have broader impact. And I am flattered if you choose to subscribe to my channel or to this uh, podcast. Uh, and, any, and I certainly would welcome your taking a look at my book, uh, Soloists, uh, uh, on Amazon. Just search Soloists and my last name, N-E-M-K-O, Nemco, and you'll find it. Uh, and and I do like to end if end each of these. This is going to be a podcast. I like to end each of these with uh, my very favorite quote, which I do believe is more relevant today than ever. It is, "We find comfort among those who agree with us, growth among those who don't." I'm Marty Nemco. <laughs>